I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Symposium, where we talk about the ideas at the basis of a free society. And my guest today is Andy Craig of the Cato Institute. Thanks for coming on. Hi there. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to have you on a couple things uh, to talk about. One of them is what's happened to the Libertarian Party of late. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, like uh, a lot of people who are sort of vaguely on the right or classical liberal, I've always looked to the Libertarian Party as offering this sort of third alternative, a potential third party that would offer us a different choice than the Republicans or the Democrats. And what's recently had the, the 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 Libertarian Party has often kind of disappointed on that, both in terms of performance and in terms of its offerings. But what's happened recently has been, I think, a little more ominous that they seem to have been sort of captured by the nationalist right or by the alt right. Uh, and so I want you to talk a little bit about what exactly has happened with this sort of Mises caucus takeover of the Libertarian Party apparatus. Sure. I mean, I was uh, involved in the Libertarian Party for a long time uh, before I was at Cato, which I should clarify is certainly not affiliated and Cato's nonpartisan. And I speak for myself on these things. Yeah, and there's one thing we should, I think, say at the outset, which is there's the Libertarian movement and there's the Libertarian Party. And they, you know, sort of the way the conservative movement and the Republican Party, they're not exactly the same thing, although they off, sometimes often coincide. For sure. Um I mean, most, uh, you know, what we would call lowercase l libertarians are not, uh, had never been involved in the party, and that's been the case uh, going back a long time. Um, but I was. I, uh, I ran for office a couple of times. I was in party leadership roles at various levels, um, and I worked for Jerry Johnson's 2016 presidential campaign, which was, you know, the best result the party's ever seen. It felt like this was kind of a breakout moment there for a bit. Um, but since then, uh, particularly in the last year or so, um, and this, is, this has been bubbling up for a couple of years, but it really kind of culminated in the past year. Um, as you noted, the party has been basically taken over by the alt-right, um, by this group that they call themselves the Mises Caucus. Um, like certain others, they're not particularly uh, aligned with the actual views of Ludwig von Mises, um, but they're... The party has this structure that that unfortunately made it very susceptible to this, um, where glossing over some uh, nuances, but basically how it works is whoever shows up at the state conventions gets to vote to pick the state party leaders and the delegates to the national party convention, and then the national party convention happens and picks the national committee. Um, and this process was, you know, stuffed basically by a bunch of people who came in and, and put some very um, unsavory characters in charge of it. And I left the party. A bunch of my friends left the party. Um, the total party membership has collapsed by, um, officially, it's by about a fifth. I think if you consider the actual active membership, it's probably more than that. Um, and they've been getting a lot of negative attention. Most recently, uh, the New Hampshire party, which has been kind of one of the most outrageous is just tweeting really gross stuff. They did a, uh, it got more attention. They did a thing mocking Meghan McCain for crying over her father's casket on the anniversary of John McCain's death. Um, but I thought worse, uh, was they're also doing Holocaust denial stuff. So that's, um, and that also got noticed. CNN ran a bit on it. Jerusalem Post noticed it um, as they tend to do when people are saying gross things about the Holocaust. Um, and so that's that's kind of where things stand now. Um, the party is fracturing. Uh, already one state party has withdrawn from the national party and said it's not affiliated with it anymore. Um, and there's just kind of this, you know, perpetual, oh, God, what did they say this time in terms of, you know, they got a hold of these official party accounts and are, are just, you know, tweeting basically the, you know, grossest stuff you can imagine. It's like, you know, Proud Boys, QAnon conspiracy theorist, racism, gay bashing stuff. And, right. Uh, and so let's be specific, a little more specific about that, because, you know, there's lots of sort of fake accusation of, ra of racism to get thrown around. And I get people like anytime you accuse somebody of racism, they say, oh, the media always makes that up. But this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is like actual real Holocaust style, actual real QAnon conspiracy stuff. Yeah. That, that they're doing. And, and the, the New Hampshire party, their, especially their Twitter feed, sort of got taken over first by this crowd. And then um, 
uh, and then they basically then became the National Libertarian Party became a mouthpiece run by essentially the same people. That's right. And yeah, when when I say you know <laughs> racist and Holocaust now stuff, I'm not I'm not being metaphorical or exaggerating. I mean, this is they're saying stuff like black people should go back to Africa. Um, they're doing stuff like making fun of the idea that six million is the correct number or reasonable estimate for the number of Jews killed in the Holocaust. Like this is not this is not subtle dog whistle stuff. This is full blown mask off, just disgusting, bigoted crap. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you're right. It's not dog whistles. It's saying it openly. So there is a certain history to this, though, because, you know, how this got to be. So we have to talk about how this got to be the, the von Mises caucus. Uh, the Mises caucus uh, became this group is, you know, what does this have to do with Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises? It has very little to do with him, except that what the history here is that going back to Murray Rothbard, who I believe is a student of von Mises, who created the Ludwig von Mises Institute and so it was the sort of the Rothbardian wing and the people who came after Rothbard, uh, Llewellyn Rockwell and people and and people who were sort of in the Ron Paul orbit. And going back to the 80s, they had this idea of the was sort of paleo libertarianism, they call it, where you were going to have this sort of outreach from the libertarian uh, and anarchist libertarians outreach from them to the religious conservatives and to the, sort of the Pat Buchanan wing of the right. And, and for younger people, Pat Buchanan was basically Donald Trump before Donald Trump. Uh, and so you have this long history of this idea of forming this alliance between the paleo conservatives, uh, the, the Pat Buchanan religious conservative, you know, dog whistle racist type of conservatives and the libertarians and it seems like you know that seems like it had died out years ago and now it's come roaring back yeah i think that's fair i mean if you want to <clears throat> one text i refer people to was uh, in 1992 um murray rothbard uh, as you mentioned wrote a, an essay that uh, basically spelled it out and this had already begun by then but this is when he kind of articulated it um and it's called uh, a right-wing populism, a strategy for the paleo movement. And it, in it, he opens by lamenting the fact that David Duke, the notorious Klansman who had advanced in the uh, governor election in Louisiana the year before, he was, you know, lamenting his loss. Um, that that it's a shame this this you know. Uh, literal grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan had not been elected governor of Louisiana. Um, and so, yeah, that's been the tone of it. And they're on their own terms, their justification for it is, well, these people are the most anti-establishment. They're going to help us tear down uh, the welfare state and their anti-war and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it, it's, it gets to be kind of hair splitting. At what point are you pandering? To that and at what point have you just become that um and i think we're seeing that you know it, get, it really quickly gets to where it doesn't make any difference if that's what you're pandering to that's what you've become yeah it's uh, ace's rule of goat supplies yeah. um so which i won't spell out here people can look up the rule of goats um so the <laughs> this also isn't the first time though that that something has happened i remember there was a I think it's Howard Stern years ago, uh, had a bunch of his people flood into the Demo the Libertarian Party uh, convention in New York. So there is that, you put it that there's that structural issue with the Libertarian Party. But I think that also reflects the fact that the Libertarian Party is so small that it becomes easy for one really motivated, organized faction to take it over. So to some extent, to what extent is this a reflection of the fact that I hate to put it this way, that the Libertarian Party is a failed experiment, that they they failed to thrive enough to get a large enough constituency that they couldn't be taken over by a small faction? That's definitely part of it, though. I think the structural choice has more to do with it, because, I mean, if you look at what happened in 2016, Gary Johnson got four and a half million votes. Um, and, and even beyond that, you know, the Libertarian voter race is in the low millions, high hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and that is the kind of thing that would be hard to supplant, even though it's even though it's still small in the grand scheme of American politics. It, it, it's not the kind of thing you show up with 50 people to a meeting some Saturday and, and vote out. But that's the way the party works, unfortunately. Um, this was this, this structural decision that was made um, that those voters as such had no control over the party. It's 
uh, give or take two or 3,000 people, uh, realistically, who show up and participate in these state conventions and then the national convention. Um, and, you know, if you, if you talk about how many people showed up to really do the takeover, it's, you know, about that many, maybe a couple thousand nationwide. This is not a mass movement by any stretch of the imagination um, in terms of American politics. This is a tiny drop in the bucket. Um, but the fact that the, the party has some degree of notoriety because it has been the most prominent third party for a while, um, particularly in the Gary Johnson era, um, you know, the last three elections in a row, the, the LP has been in third, distant, very distant third place, but still third place um, compared to, you know, uh, the Greens and other minor parties. Um, but it's, it's definitely the case that, that the fact that they, you had that larger Gary Johnson voting base that wasn't really brought in and wasn't used shield to protect the party, um, that wasn't given a real say in how the party is run and governed. Um, is unfortunate, and it, it really is uh, the fact that the party was basically run as, a, as this kind of so you have this convention circuit, and, and you have the Roberts Rules parliamentary procedure game that people show up and play, um, and, and all of that was just very susceptible to a kind of hostile, organized effort. Uh, you know, real, really, if you, at these state party conventions, if you show up with 50 people, um, you can you can do that, and it doesn't matter if the message you're running on is something that's going to be repulsive to the you know 300,000 libertarian voters you have in that state, um, because those are normal people who don't want to spend their Saturday uh, arguing nonsense uh, under Robert's rules. Well, and that, that's always been a problem with the Libertarian Party too. That I remember Gary Johnson when he was do, doing the, the the primary or convention that that selected him as candidate had to deal with people, you know, attacking him because he thought that, uh, uh, that driver's licenses might be valid. And, you know, that he yeah, had this very sort of dogmatic doctrine or libertarian thing that no, there shouldn't, the guy, the state shouldn't be issuing driver's licenses. Um, but so one of the things I want to ask actually is I do think that the, the Gary Johnson candidacy was a relative success, but from my perspective, I remember looking at it during the 2016, uh, uh, during the 2016 election, especially that you had, you know, Donald Trump had the Republicans had picked a, picked Donald Trump. There were a lot of very disaffected people on the right who would normally be Republican voters who were sort of casting about for an alternative. And I found it strange that Gary Johnson seemed to sort of um, uh, uh, focus more on trying to peel off Democratic voters, you know, from Hillary Clinton and, and trying to appeal to them with, with some of his messaging and some of his rhetoric. And didn't really, I didn't think they really mounted a, that the kind of offensive that I would expect them to do to try to peel off, you know, 20% of the Republican Party, which I think might have been doable. Well, if you look at the exit polls, I mean, Johnson did still pull more otherwise Trump than otherwise Clinton voters. Um, and the ticket was, you know, two ex Republican governors and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's true. I mean, we were, I think, we, this was not my, <laughs> not, not like I was making the calls or anything, um, but the campaign was, you know, making a pitch for a kind of liberal center, um, a broad based approach and did try to appeal to both sides. And, um, you know, there's, there's various things that, that could have, could have gone better, uh, you know, at some point, at some point he was polling in the low double digits and obviously ended up getting a lot fewer votes than that for various reasons. Um, I think one of the big mistakes that might have actually changed the outcome of the election is that uh, down the last six to eight weeks or so, um, the Democrats decided they're going to turn very hostile and go on a, an attack campaign against Johnson. And that absolutely backfired because all it did, and we see this in the polls, is it drove a couple of points from Johnson to Trump. Hillary didn't benefit at all. Trump is the one who benefited. From when uh, you had uh, Clinton and Colbert and MSNBC and all the rest of them decide we're going to turn all our firepower on on this little third party candidate down the final stretch um, because they misread the polls in terms of who uh, Johnson was pulling more votes for. Um, so yeah, I mean you know it's it's been it's been a while now. Certainly, I think there were plenty of in hindsight strategic um, mistakes uh, on on all sides in terms of 
uh, things that could have been done differently. But it's still the true that it's still uh, true that Kerry Johnson ended up getting ten times more than what's normal for the Libertarian presidential candidate. So, so I also I think what it might be more interesting we talk about is maybe the some of the ideological weaknesses of the of the Libertarian Party that. That contributed to this, and the one thing, as you mentioned, is that you know the 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 whole premise for this sort of paleo conservative, uh, paleo libertarian uh, uh, cooperation was the idea that you know these people will help us tear down the state. And I know it's it's been a, a problem with the libertarian movement a little bit, and especially with the libertarian party, that it's like they hate the state more than they. It's almost like they hate the state more than they love liberty. Uh, that is, you know, it, or they they collapse the the um, cause of being in favor of freedom. They collapse that into being into a hatred of the existing government and the existing establishment. And I think that maybe that has created sort of that that space for say, oh, well, we are, we're, we hate the establishment too. In fact, we'll be meaner about, uh, you know, we'll mock Meghan McCain. We'll be meaner about going after the establishment than anybody else. And so therefore, if you really hate the state, if you really hate the establishment, uh, then, then you should go with us. Right. I mean, I, that's one of the reasons, um, you know, that I have a lot of uh, friends who are philosophical anarchists and who are very opposed to this sort of Mises caucus stuff, but it does touch on part of the reason why I'm not um, and why Ludwig von Mises was not and F.A. Hayek was not and Milton Friedman was not. Um, I, I think there is a point to it that once you once you get into this um, into this space where you're talking about a hypothetical stateless society, it's really easy to justify a lot of terrible things by just saying, well, that's not the state. It's notionally private, so it's okay. Um, and, and I think when you ditch the concept of the state, you also ditch a lot of the important ideas about how and why we limit the state. Um, and so that, you know, that does get, I think you're, you're onto something that certainly um, the greater preponderance of anarchists in the LP relative to the broader movement, and I think it's still a minority in both, um, yeah. But it's still the case that I, I think on a fundamental level, it does open up some really unfortunate uh, ideological pathways. So the other thing I want to talk about, though, is, you know, acknowledge that for all the troubles the Libertarian Party has had, that starting a third party on our system is actually legitimately extremely hard. Mm -hmm. Right, You need a large constituency that's disaffected by the main parties and and typically what's happened you know i think part of one of the things that happened to the libertarian party in the early 2000 in the early 2010s is with the tea party movement that the republican party was seen as being somewhat more libertarian friendly you know that it saw the libertarian sort of tea party cause becoming popular and sort of it tries to absorb you know what typically happens is the minute a third party starts to become successful their cause is co-opted by one of the main parties and it, it, they kind of get absorbed and so i'm wondering though if we are at a point you know now that the libertarian party has been sort of taken over by this faction and you have a lot of people dropping out of it um whether you know the the sort of the diaspora of the libertarian party as well as there being a lot of sort of disaffected Republicans and, and, and never Trumpers and that sort of thing, you know, given what's happened to the Republican Party, whether there is space for the creation of some other uh, sort of third party. I, I've been advocating for a liberal party. I think you you have the same viewpoint that, you know, uh, using the word liberal uh, as a as a in the classical liberal sense as an organizing principle to try to bring sort of center left, center right, and liber and displaced libertarians together. Do you think there's a possibility of reviving that idea of a liberal party? I think it's a possibility. Um, certainly, as the uh, existing LP collapses, that, that will kind of open up a little bit of a lane there um, for being the third party alternative. And there's people out there trying. Andrew Yang is, is currently trying to do his thing, and we've seen various other efforts like that. Um, I think if done well, uh, there absolutely is a possibility for a strong, broad-based uh, liberal third party to get a foothold in American politics. Now, that does not necessarily mean winning the White House. It does not mean uh, winning majorities in Congress or anything like that. But I have seen it is possible to elect state legislators uh, to make serious bids for for governor in some states, 
um, for things like that to be what we would consider a real third party and not just a minor party, which is a breakout the, the LP has never really quite managed to make, even though it kind of came close with Johnson. Um, uh, one of the things about that you have to be careful is, is I've, I've talked about, there's kind of two extremes. One is that you go too ideological. And in some ways the LP made that mistake from the beginning just by picking the name libertarian which is a, a weird esoteric label that you know most Americans don't even know what it means. Uh, those who do know what it means, it has some pretty gross baggage a lot of the time. Um, and so that, that in and of itself, just the ballot label libertarian puts a, a ceiling on their possible success. Um, on the other end, <clears throat> I mentioned Andrew Yang, uh, you've seen him and the forward party stumbling uh, because they, like several other efforts that have been attempted before, are trying to do this, well, we're just pure centrism. We don't really have any positions other than therefore electoral reform, which is it's which is a good thing to support, but um, that, that you, you can't be totally substance free. Um, you have yeah. to be somewhere in the middle where you have enough appeal, appeal to a broad enough double digit percentage sector of the electorate, um, but you have to have something to rally around. And that's right. where I think something like a, a broadly liberal party which looks more like Gary Johnson's kind of libertarianism, um, but would also include not necessarily even just, you know, moderate libertarians, and you probably go a little bit broader than that. Um, but it, it can't be, it can't be just, you know, that there, there, there's no there there when you're trying to do just a pure centrist party, and that doesn't work either. So that's, that's kind of the, the needle you have to thread. Yeah, that that's where the centrists and uh, no labels people and you know Andrew Yang. I tried to figure out what the forward party stands for, and it seems to mostly stand for the fact that Andrew Yang's Andrew Yang is a really cool guy, right? It's, it's just, there's there's nothing there really except it's like his his personal vehicle. It reminded me of uh, I think years ago there was a guy running for running for president. He's running for the Republican nomination, but somebody looked at it and said, well, he, if you look at his schedule of where he's going and what he's doing, it doesn't look like a political campaign. It looks like a book tour. And that the whole, you know, the whole campaign was a sort of vehicle for his personal self-promotion rather than being a serious attempt to get the nomination. And I think that kind of is what strikes me about Andrew Yang's thing is it's more like this personal vehicle for him. Yeah. But but yeah, I think you're right that it has to be ideal. You have to have an I have to have a distinct agenda and an ideological, a broad ideological outline. But you know, on the other hand, the Libertarian Party did tend to get into these sort of esoteric uh, internal debates, like you know, struggle struggling Jerry Gary Johnson over whether valid driver's licenses were valid, and and I found that to be the case that. Um, the libertarians became almost sort of dogmatically ideological uh, in, in this, you know, because that, that one of the arguments about it is it was supposed to be sort of a big tent and we'll take people of all different ideologies so long as they agree with certain basic principles. But in practice, it tended to became very dogmatic on very specific political things that you're supposed to believe in. Right. I mean, I, I was with Gary through the, the party nomination process and it was it was very frustrating because we would have in a few states the party qualified for it and we would have a presidential primary just like the republicans and democrats who are on the ballot you know a few thousand people would come out and vote and gary would win those with 80 percent right. um but when we show up to the convention where it's the real dedicated inside the bubble play the game true believers it was difficult to eke out a 50 percent majority and it's because you get these sort of fringe esoteric uh, very specific sub ideologies that have, you know, might only have 30 dedicated adherents in the whole country, but all 30 of them are in that room and among the votes you need to get. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, it's absolutely the case that even before the current takeover, this was one of the things the LP struggled with. And I think it was, I think it was kind of baked in from the beginning and, and just in terms of calling it a libertarian party, which is a itself a contentious, uh, narrow appeal ideological term. There's a reason successful American political parties, including third parties that have done relatively well, have very generic sounding names, you know, Republican, Democratic, Reform, um, American Independent, all stuff like that. Once, you, once you've started by slapping a label on it that at best only 10% of Americans are gonna identify with, um, if you're bringing your A game at your most inclusive, then then yeah, so it's only going to be downhill from there. And 
And that's why, um, even though I, I, I look fondly upon some of the state libertarian parties that are splitting off and that sort of thing, um, I do think ultimately, if that forms the core of some broad-based liberal party or liberty or freedom or whatever it gets called, it does. It is probably going to have to rebrand. Um, I don't think the I don't think libertarian as a political party ballot label is salvageable. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that Andrew Yang's uh, proposal in, uh, or campaign does involve the one substantive thing, and it is. Uh, election reforms and, and the way reforming the way we do elections and, that, and I think that's a good transition to go to something that is more I think of, of immediate interest uh, immediate application than the potential future of the of the libertarian movement or libertarian party and that is electoral count reform mm -hmm. so you know we had the the January 6th uprising or or insurrection at the Capitol the riot out there and that was in service to an attempt by you know, former President Trump to try to stay in office by basically throwing out the results of the Electoral College. And uh, I know the one thing you've been very active talking about, and I think is 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 uh, something that's not getting enough attention, is an attempt to sort of fix, plug some of the holes there that made that possible. That's right. Yeah, I've been working on this uh, for the past year or so, writing about it at Cato, uh, working with a couple of colleagues of mine who've also been writing about it. Um, if you Google, you can find my, my policy analysis on how to how to fix the Electoral Count Act, which is uh, an exciting topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, it is one of these esoteric things, but at the same time, you know, it's from like, what, 1877 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, or 1887. Uh, it's, you know, late 19th century, something nobody paid any, any attention to. But it's one of these sort of esoteric technical things that suddenly becomes actually crucially yeah. relevant. Yeah, it's one of those things that doesn't matter until it suddenly matters a lot. And we saw in 2006 or in 2020 um, how that uh, how that happened. Um, so the Electoral Count Act is basically the statutory codification and the de and filling in the details uh, for what the Constitution says about how the presidential election process works, um, how states pick their members of the Electoral College. Uh, it sets certain key dates for when various things happen. Um, how those votes go to Congress. And then as we saw uh, on January 6th, what's usually a kind of pro forma ceremonial thing, uh, which is when the, the vice president opens the votes and they are counted before Congress. Um, and there are some uh, instances where Congress would legitimately need to something if somebody if a, a, an elector cast a vote for an ineligible presidential candidate is one example um, there's various constitutional rules they have to follow um, but unfortunately what's happened is because this law which was passed in the aftermath of the 1876 uh, disputed election uh, between Hayes and Tilden that, that very very narrowly was kind of uh, uh, solved at the last minute before Inauguration Day. Um, so afterwards, they passed this, and it, it, it's very vague, it's very poorly drafted, and it's opened up this entire argument, which is what Trump was making and what uh, people, why people stormed the Capitol on January 6th, which is this, this bad idea that's not correct, that Congress and or the Vice President has this kind of general power to just throw out any electoral votes they don't like, and that's not how it's supposed to work. And luckily now there's a bill coming along that will hopefully fix it. So what's the name of the bill? It is the Electoral Count Reform Act. Um, it's in a package with a couple other things that's been put forward by Susan Collins, uh, she's a Republican from Maine, and Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia. And they were working together with um, uh, about 10, uh, 8 to 10 Republicans and 8 to 10 Democrats in this bipartisan working group. Uh, so they've hammered out the details. They've got the draft out there. Coming up here next is probably going to go through committee and might have some fine tuning changes made then. Um, but everybody, uh, there's pretty broad bipartisan consensus to try to get this thing uh, passed by the end of the year. So yeah, I find I find it interesting how bipartisan it is because there's probably a lot of Republican congressmen who <clears throat> would not openly come out and say, "Oh, I think we should keep Donald Trump from being president again." But who will then, you know, quietly on some rule change that the the base isn't really paying attention to, will make it a whole lot more difficult <laughs> for him to to stage another version of what he tried to do in 2020. 
And, and this is a bipartisan thing. I mean, uh, Democrats have abused this process too, not as egregiously as what happened mm -hmm. with Trump, uh, but the Democrats have raised frivolous objections to electoral votes in Congress over the years. Um, I mean, we've pointed out to people, imagine, imagine down the road that, uh, you know, 20 years from now or something, Donald Trump's long gone, but the Republican nominee wins the electoral college, but has lost the popular vote again. And there's a Democratic majority in Congress. Do you want that Democratic majority in Congress to be able to just throw out votes to flip the result? Um, so this, it, it, that's been one of the fun things working on this. It's kind of a veil of ignorance scenario where nobody knows who's going to have the congressional majority or who's going to hold the vice presidency and the various offices, who's going to be the apparent winner. Um, so there's been a lot of really encouraging kind of good faith on principle approach to it uh, from offices on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, and it, it sort of strikes me as a little bit like, I mean, the fact that there's not a lot of people paying attention to this, there's a whole theory, I don't know if you've probably heard of, called secret Congress, right? Mm -hmm. That that when something becomes really publicized and well-known and the partisans get involved, that's when progress tends to stall out. But when something is, you know, the public is generally not paying attention to something and it's happening sort of behind the scenes and you have bipartisan cooperation going on, that's where a lot of stuff gets done. So secret Congress does a lot of stuff. But then the minute something becomes a partisan football, all progress stops. So and just, <laughs> that's why I feel almost like uh, a little leery about bringing any extra publicity to electoral account reform, uh, because, you know, once if if Mark Levin and, and uh, uh, Sean Hannity get a hold of it and make it a football, maybe some of the Republicans will drop out. But I do think it's really important. And it, it underscores the the extent that there's a um, a limit to legalism in our system. That is, you know, that a lot of our a lot of our political system operates on the honor system. Uh, that it 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 works because everybody sort of grasps the spirit of the thing and goes along, and doesn't test the exact precise legal limits of everything. Right, and that's what happened for you know hundred and something years uh, when the when the DCA was never really tested too strongly. Um, you know, everybody understood that Congress doesn't elect the president. We have the electoral college. You take the votes from them, and that's that. Uh, but there there is a lot of uh, you know once you get into really stress testing it and kind of playing out the hostile scenarios, um, which we saw some of last time uh there's 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 a lot of room for mischief and it's worth fixing and it's um i mean it, and it's generally been the case that um even the kind of um most trump supportive uh wing of the gop has not made a big deal out of opposing these fixes i mean one thing is is th their their previous position about the powers of the vice president well now kamala harris is vice president so um you know, there's some of that going on to it. There's some of it that it's just, it's too technical for people to pay a ton of attention to. Um, Trump himself has popped off a couple of times taking swipes at it, but it hasn't become a huge focus. Um, and we had uh, earlier, uh, this before the Congress went into recess for their August recess, there was a Senate rules hearing um, and the Republicans and the Democrats were all very, uh, with the one exception of Ted Cruz, I wrote a little bit about this on the Cato blog, if people want to check it out. Uh, but in general, it was very bipartisan, um, everybody kind of agreeing um, uh, with uh, Amy Klobuchar was the Democrat chairing it and uh, Roy Blunt was the ranking Republican. Um, and they've all been, I mean, it was all very, it was, it was, it was kind of refreshing for somebody who has, you know, particularly coming from a, a cynical libertarian angle of, of, oh, Congress doesn't work. Um, I think ECA reform so far, of course, we haven't gotten to the finish line yet, but so far it has been a very uh, um, encouraging case where uh, every everybody on both sides just genuinely wants to get this right. And there are difficult technical questions about um, how exactly you draft some of these things. And so that's, that's really where the focus has been. There has not been a ton of, um, I mean, to the degree there's been kind of outspoken partisan opposition, there's been some from the left too, you know, people mad that this doesn't do all the various voting rights act things and the John Lewis act that they want, wanted to pass, that they couldn't pass. Um, but, you know, that ultimately hasn't been much of an obstacle either. Yeah, I think it's interesting that, you know, you, you said for all the cynicism we have, uh, libertarian or otherwise, the cynicism we have about how Congress works. That there are cases, and I think you know the chaos at the Capitol in January six did concentrate a lot of minds, and so I think there are times when they can step up. Like I said, when when the partisan forces are not 
causing them to to knuckle under. There are times when they can stand up and and, and do the right thing. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping this will be one of those cases. My guest today has been Andy Craig of the Cato Institute talking about the Libertarian Party and the much more pressing issue uh, in immediate terms of Electoral Count Reform Act. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Rob. I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Symposium. If you like this video or this podcast, uh, please like or subscribe to our uh, to us on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting platform. Uh, and you can also find uh, more discussion of the ideas, the basis of a free society at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.